presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family's legacy of building the great state of Idaho. Coming up, from a slave turned spy to a famous character from Shakespeare, my guest today has a passion for imagining lives in the past. A conversation with historical novelist Lois Levine, next on Dialogue. Stay tuned. Hello and welcome to Dialogue, I'm Marcia Franklin. My guest today is fascinated by the possible lives of people in the past, both real and imagined. Lois Levine is the author of two popular historical novels, The Secrets of Mary Bowser, about a freed slave in Richmond, Virginia turned spy for the Union during the Civil War, and Juliet's Nurse, which conjures up the life and times of the nurse in Romeo and Juliet, a seemingly minor figure who actually plays a major role. The Portland, Oregon-based author has a PhD from the University of California, Los Angeles, and has taught at UCLA and Reed College. Her writing has also appeared in major newspapers and magazines, as well as on NPR. And Lois Levine joins me now. Welcome to you. Thanks. It's great to be here, Marcia. It's great to have you. Let's first start by defining for folks, in a laywoman's terms, mm -hmm. what we mean by historical fiction. Well, I guess in the most basic level, it's really any novel that's set in the past. And I think that that's one of the challenges. There's no sort of way to, to tell how rigorous the history is. So if it's set in the past, is it an accurate representation of the past or not? And for me, the joy of historical fiction is really using character and story to help teach people about the past and share with them what historians are learning through their own research. And because you also have a, a doctorate, I assume you try to be as assiduous as possible about that setting around yes. the character. Even if you don't know a lot about the character herself, you're going to get that setting and timeline as correct as possible. That's right. That always thinking about what was possible and probable in a particular historical moment and how people lived their lives against both the confines and also the possibilities of their historical moment. Well, let's first talk about The Secrets of Mary Bowser. This is a fabulous story. Yeah. It's almost like, wow, why hadn't somebody written about it before? But in part, they haven't written about it because there aren't a lot of, of yes. details about Mary Bowser. But as I read your book, I, I was thinking, you know, if this had been part of my history class, I might have paid more attention <laughs> in some respects. Um, she was a house slave in Richmond, Virginia, freed by the daughter, essentially, of her, mm -hmm. of her mistress, a uh, very interesting character in her own right, a woman named Bette Van Loo, yeah. who we'll, we'll talk about, who sent her to get educated. And then, during the Civil War, she came back to Richmond and she ended up as a spy in the Confederate White House. I mean, gosh. You know, I love this story in part because Mary Bowser took kind of this tenet at the heart of slavery, that blacks were inferior and particularly intellectually inferior to whites. And she contests that stereotype by playing to it. She pretends to be exactly what the stereotype expects. And for that reason, she can do what no white spy can do. She can be in places without being suspected at all. She wasn't above suspicion. She was sort of beneath suspicion because you just couldn't imagine a black woman being able to read or having a network to convey the information she learned outside of the Confederate capital and to Union forces. So she's looking uh, supposedly, or we think, at, at papers on Jefferson yeah. Davis's desk, relaying that information via cipher, via, via code, to her former mistress, or mm -hmm. Bette Van Loo, who's part of what uh, also was new to me, which were Southern Unionists. Yes. They were uh, people who, you know, lived in the South, but uh, wanted to see slaves freed and well so that's a that depended there were some people of them were, right yeah. there were people who were pro union but also pro slavery yeah. and certainly there were states that stayed in the union and didn't secede that were slave states so we sometimes think of those as the same thing they're not necessarily but probably one third of the people living in the confederate capital the whites who were living in the confederate capital were pro union so it was a very strange milieu in which to try and rule a country. And, and uh, Bette Van Loo had sent uh, 
Mary, even before the Civil War, yes. to get educated. There was some promise in her, yes. apparently. And we know this from the, from the documentation. We know at least these facts. Um, yeah, and we know that although Bet was anti-slavery, that Mary was treated differently from other slaves that the Van Lu family owned. In part, we know this because of church records. Mary was baptized in the Van Lu's family church. That's a white church. And we know that other Van Lu slaves were not baptized there. Mary was also married in the church. So one of the few things I know for sure is on particular days, she was in this church. Okay, so this is fiction, as we mentioned mm -hmm. at the top. You're making most of this up. You're relying on a few shreds of details we know about this of Mary Bowser. First of all, why did you decide to write in the voice of an African American as opposed to, say, Bette Van Lu, who's white? Bette is, she's white and she's from a well-off family and her life is really well documented. There's, there are great biographies about her that have been written. And Mary's story was less well known. I felt it had been lost to history and I wanted to give her her voice. To construct her story, I looked at what I could learn about the lives of enslaved and free blacks, both in Richmond, Virginia, which is urban and industrialized. So it's not like being on a plantation. One out of five blacks in the city is free. So that as, even as an enslaved person, you knew free blacks and that sense of possibility was always there. And then looking at the black community in Philadelphia, we're not entirely sure that's where she went to be educated, but it's a likely place. What was the black community in Philadelphia like and what would it be like to live in that milieu? So again, although I'm imagining her particular life, it's based on what actual people's lives were like. But how do you get her voice? I mean, you're, you're, you're from the East and you're white. Yes. So how do you, how do you uh, get inside her head and think about the way that she would have talked? And, and also, again, you're from a different background than she is. Well, part of it is that the way I came to write this novel, I'm an accidental novelist. I didn't mean to write novels. I was doing my dissertation research, and my work is on African-American literature and African-American history. So I had read slave narratives and diaries and letters. And when I came across Mary Bowser's story, I thought, well, wow, this is a story that could get people who are never going to read the original historical sources or even read a history book. They might read this novel and learn a lot about this era. So that's why I decided to make the leap to fiction. I knew I couldn't write a biography. There's just not enough documentation. And the question of voice to me is not just crossing the line as a white woman writing about an African-American or writing from that point of view, although that is important to think about what that means. But in the book, we don't know anything about Mary Bowser's actual family, so I invent a little story. I know that Bette Van Loo's family, was her father was from New York, so I have Mary's mother be somebody who is from New York. People forget that there was slavery in New York well into mm -hmm. the 19th century. Mary's father I have be from Tidewater, Virginia. Now, if you know New Yorkers, I am from New York, or you know Virginians, we are very different people, New Yorkers and Virginians. And so if you look at her parents, their voices are very different, their personalities are very different, the way that they try to negotiate life under slavery is different, because I'm being true to a New Yorker and a Virginian. But was it hard for you to come up with the voice of, of Mary uh, again? It did seem rather modern when I was reading it, her language. Um, so I, I'm just wondering how you got into I felt like her, her head. Voice, her voice actually came more easily to me than some of the voices. And some of it is tracking how she changes during the novel. When she goes off to be educated, she starts using what we might call $25 words. She's very excited to be educated and she shows off and she uses words that honestly I didn't know until I had to find them to come out of her mouth because if you know any teenager, once they start to feel like they're smarter than everyone, they're using their show-offy words. She, you know, she has a very dramatic life in your, in your book. Yeah. I mean, really, there's a lot of dramatic scenes there where she could be found out, and mm -hmm. actually Bette Van Lu could be found out and, and close right. to getting harmed. So you had to create this tension all the way through. We don't know if that existed or not, but we do know that President Grant specifically said yes. he got excellent information from Miss Van Lu. In fact, he made her postmistress of the area afterwards right. as, a, as, a, as you know, you know, a present. Yes. Um, and she herself said her best information was from one of her right. former Right. She slaves. said in general from so the Negroes, it, the term she would have used, and but, she, she names Mary specifically. But this is dangerous yes. stuff. I mean... Um, yeah, the... Um, 
the first person who was hanged for treason in the United States since, or in what we would call the United States, since the Revolutionary War were spies who were spying in Richmond and were caught and suspected. So this was definitely dangerous work for these two women to be doing and to be working together across racial lines was a, just a fascinating idea of what their relationship would be. It, it's, just, it's just a great story. Did you feel weird though as a scholar, as somebody who is um, rooted in history, making up so much yeah. because there's so little known about Mary except for that she was baptized, she did do this, right. uh, she did get educated. That's a, we, we really don't know that much. So you had to make up so much. You have to give yourself permission to say this is about character and story. Again, using deep research about other people's lives as I could find it, but also thinking about um, when you're a historian, you are also always taking facts and working from facts to conjecture. If you ask any historian, how did Abraham Lincoln feel about slavery, you will never get a short answer. That even when we're writing factual history, that question of interpretation of conjecture is always part of it. So that gave me the permission to say, what would it be like to put her in this circumstance and to think about what the lessons from history were that I wanted readers to learn. Did you ever get criticism from historians about I what was, you've done? I was very concerned about this, and I have to say, actually, they've been pretty welcoming, in part because it's, the history is good. Again, you can pick up works of historical fiction, and some of them may not be good at all, and people may not even be thinking about this as important. But I think part of it is historians know that I love history and that I want to share it with you the got broader it right. public. You got that part of it, yeah. And they're excited to see their work represented in a way that's more accessible to a different kind of audience. And did you get any criticism for being a white person writing as a black woman? It's very interesting, especially when I speak to black audiences, because you could see they've come into the room, they've seen my picture on the poster, they know that I'm white. The first five minutes, they're usually very polite. And the more I talk, and especially start to read from the book, there's a shift in the tone in the room because they feel like, okay, you got it right. I don't think everybody loves any one book. So I wouldn't say, oh yes, I've written a book that will please everyone. But I think that the care and the respect that I bring to the subject is what people are responding to. So you alluded to the message that you wanted people to get from the book about this, about yeah. this uh, freed slave who, who turned spy. Talk about those, that message or messages. Yeah, I would say one is that freedom always came at a cost, that we like the idea of you know, the Underground Railroad and somebody escaping. But even if you escaped, which Mary did not, but even if you did, you were leaving behind your whole community. So when Mary is freed, her family is not. And to seize her freedom, she has to leave behind the people that she loves. And of course- And, and what I learned is in down there, if you were freed, you had one year mm -hmm. to get out of Dodge. Yes. And if you came back, you could be right. ar arrested. I mean, it was illegal for a freed slave to come back into that territory. I didn't- That in Virginia, there were people who were free blacks whose family had been freed for generations, but then a law was passed saying that newly freed blacks could not remain in the state and free blacks couldn't enter the state. So when she was leaving, she didn't know if she would ever see her family again. So lessons like that, and of course, that's what the Civil War is. It's that freedom came at a devastating cost to the nation north and south. So that was one of the messages. Another message is just the, the role, I mean, people will often say to me, how come I've never heard of Mary Bowser? And I will say, can you name five African Americans who helped end slavery? And most of us can't. And it's not as though Abraham Lincoln woke up one day and thought, oh, slavery is wrong. Let me do something about that. There were generations of African Americans, free and enslaved, who were working to end slavery. And so part of it is also just writing that story back into history. And for those people who know their history, if they read it in the novel, will find that there are a lot of real people who become characters of the novel because I'm trying to cram as many of their stories in. So it also is not just the heroic story of one woman, but really showing how different people were responding to slavery and how they were working to try and challenge it. And you want people to learn more, don't yes. you? I mean, you want people to use this book <laughs> yes. and say, like I did, oh, wow, uh, Unionists in the South. L let me go find a book. I guess there's right. one called The South Versus the South that I now want to read yeah. because I you know, yeah. learn more. And I encourage people, there's a C-SPAN um, discussion about this book and about Mary Van, uh, or sorry, Bette Van Loo that's very interesting if you want to look it up. Real briefly, um, she, she did 
live, and um, we know a few details. She mm -hmm. ended up in Georgia for mm -hmm. a while and then kind of vanishes, and she gave talks for a while up north about being a spy. Yes, after talks the Talks that are kind of contradictory, you know, it, it's hard so to even tell what she did from her own words. This is part of why I feel okay imagining her life, because even when she was telling her own story, you're right, after the war she gave some lectures in the north we know about them because they're newspaper accounts. But you can look at one account of one talk and another account of another talk and a letter or two that we found of hers. And she tells different stories, yeah. wildly different stories. Sometimes she will say, I never knew who my parents were. Sometimes she will say, my mother was a white woman and my father was Cuban. I mean, they, they can't all be true. And she uses pseudonyms. She uses pseudonyms. And, but she, the reason she was doing all of this was that even after the war, she was making a case for freedom is not enough. We need equality. And let me show you what's wrong with the inequality that we still have in this country. And so she would tell her life story as ever she imagined the audience would respond because she wanted them to get to the larger point, which was a larger point about racial justice. And we're finding out more information every year about yes. her. So it'd be really cool when things are fully digitized to <laughs> Maybe there will be more information, which is really neat. Yeah. Um, if people start typing in Mary Bowser and, and, and looking for a representation photographically of her or wondering why I don't have one up, this is also an interesting story. Yes. We'll briefly tell people if they stumble across a picture of Mary Bowser, it's... Not my Mary. Fake. Um, <laughs> that there was a picture that had circulated of her, allegedly of her. Reliable re websites were using it. But the outfit did not look right. It looked a little too late for the time period. And after two years of archival research, I finally found the original. And it's a photograph of another woman named Mary <laughs> Bowser. But it was taken in 1900, and the woman in the photograph is probably about 30. So it is impossible that she was alive, let alone spying, but during just, the Civil War. It just speaks to how, in this digital age, we're so hungry, I know myself too, for images right. of what we're talking about. And they can be wrong. And that also we live in a world where we expect to type something into a search engine yeah. and get an answer right, right away. So the idea that we may never know what she looks like. And in fact, somebody who was running a, an article I'd written and wanted to use that picture, and I said, you can't. They said, well, do you have another picture of Mary Bowser? <laughs> I said, no, we don't have most picture, pictures of most people who are enslaved. And that that expectation is a very 21st century expectation. Well, I, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about your uh, your other book, uh, your most recent book, Juliet's Nurse, mm -hmm. and really this is also about a woman working under very adverse yeah. situation, uh, s situations, the 1400s in Verona, um, plague is all around, um, she's poor, she has lost her own baby, and she's a wet nurse to the famous uh, Capulets, mm -hmm. and um, this book the title came to you just boom, right? It was just kind of a bolt of lightning type thing. Yes, while I was struggling trying to write another novel <laughs> that may never see the light of day, um, the title Juliet's Nurse came to me. And I went back and did what I hadn't done since high school, and I think most of us haven't, which is to read Romeo and Juliet. And in this Shakespeare, who in some ways is trying to invent the novel before it exists, gives the nurse the third largest number of lines in the play, so she's not a minor character, though we think of her that way. We think of her as comic, but she actually has, in Shakespeare, that tragic backstory of her own child dying and having this other child. I mean, what a devastating loss. And then being given another child in your grief to care for and having such an emotional but physically intimate relationship, but also always being a servant in the family. I thought that is a relationship I want to explore, and a way to think about, again, another time period, the 14th century in Italy. As you said, plague has come. The, the book is set 10 years after the first wave of plague. The plague has killed 40% of the population. For us today, that would be devastating, and we know a lot more about infection and disease and why some people get sick and some people don't, and some people die and some people live. So trying to make sense of that when you don't understand any of the science of it, but it's also a moment really when the medieval period is kind of giving way to the Renaissance and thinking about what real people's lives were like, particularly women's lives were like in that moment. And just like Mary Bowser, she's in a household where she can learn all the secrets. Yes. And 
play off of that or you know I mean she's got both these women have power because they know secrets of the household and and the, in this instance the nurse knows intimately what's going on with with Juliet with the masters right that we I call them the Capoletti Shakespeare's a great writer I hope one day to be as good a writer but he's not always the best historian or good on cultural details so he gives them English sounding names I call them the Capoletti and the Montecchi but that she through her eyes we get a window into things like well what is a wealthy couple's marriage like in that time period she's looking at Juliet's parents and wondering whether this is really a life that she would wish for herself or that she would wish for Juliet this child that she loves so was this easier to research because you didn't have you weren't wedded to uh, you know I mean with with Mary Bowser she's a real person and so when you make up details about her some people could look at it and be critical but Ju uh, Juliet's nurse well, it was just the opposite, it's actually. harder because well, you don't know anything about Italy. Part of it is that Mary Bowser, I had done this research. I was teaching and writing about the anti-slavery movement. 14th century Italy, I don't know anything about it. And it's much harder to research. I don't read Latin or medieval Italian dialects. So I'm relying on what other historians have done. I can't really do my own research. Um, but also, it's this is very different because medievalists will admit that often what information they have it's very hard because our sources are just more limited so that so you had to look at uh, art and architecture right and you can find images for example because childbirth is always both a wonderful and terrifying experience in in human experience there are gifts that people would give to sort of ensure a good pregnancy and they would often have pictures of what were called in Italy the parto room the, the birthing room and so you can see what the layout of that room was like, where the mother would be, where the child would be, where the wet nurse would be, because hiring somebody to breastfeed your child was very common in that time period. So I could look at the art and get a sense of the place and what people were wearing, but also where they're positioned and what that tells us about their relationships. So what messages were you trying to convey to a broader audience, non-medievalist audience, right. in writing this book about the imagined life of Juliet's nurse and the 1300s of 14th century. And that was, that took a long time for me to figure out because the first book is about race in America. There's big stories to tell. And part of it is realizing that um, Romeo and Juliet is the most famous play in the English language. But it's also the most famous literary work about suicide, particularly about the suicide of a child. So some of it is that relationship of loss and grief that plagues the nurse from the beginning, her own child dying, and Spoiler alert, things do not work out well for Juliet. <laughs> if you're unhappy about that, blame Shakespeare. I could only work with what he gave me. But how did somebody in a period, 40% of the population dead from plague, children dying, how did people deal with loss and continue on? We have all sorts of concepts and tools and therapies that they did not have. And so in some ways it is a story about survival in an incredibly difficult historical moment. And just as I learned from, from your other novel, I learned from this as well. For instance, Romeo wasn't such a great guy. <laughs> yes, and again, don't blame me. Read the, read the play know. again, and you'll see. I think that film has made him into a hero, in part because it's always a good lead. But that actually, he Juliet is not the first woman he's trying to seduce, or girl he's trying to seduce. She's not even the first member of the Capulet family he's trying to seduce. Um, I say you wouldn't want him dating your 14-year-old daughter. <laughs> but also we only see him from the point of view of the nurse. And so it's her story and how will she feel as any mother of a 14-year-old or father of a 14-year-old daughter might feel about somebody coming to date your daughter. Now just as you discovered in your research about Mary Bowser that the, the uh, supposed photo of hers was, was not really her likeness, um, you've written an interesting article as well about the balcony yes. in Romeo and Juliet. The oh, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> it's not really there. It's not, the, <laughs> Shakespeare gives us a window, and he's really specific about that. And what's interesting to me about the balcony is that there's a playwright named Thomas Otway who writes a play called Caius Marius. I would not necessarily recommend reading this play. He writes it in the late 1600s, and into the 1700s it's very popular, and he steals plot and lines from Romeo and Juliet and puts them in another setting and he puts his Lavinia onto a balcony where she says wherefore art thou Marius Which sounds wrong to us but in the early part of the 18th century people thought of a balcony scene from this other play 
we think of Shakespeare as having always been the greatest English playwright. And to me, what's important about the balcony is remembering, actually, no, he fell out of favor. Somebody else was more popular. We even heard of that guy, that our ideas of canon change with time. Have you had any pushback from Shakespearean, uh, Shakespeareanists? How do you call them? Sh I guess Shakespearean scholars. Shakespearean I would say. scholars on on. No, I think that they're sort of. Uh, so there's a Shakespearean who blurbs the book, so I feel like I'm in officially. Yeah. I think that um, that they enjoy the, again the play that I have with Shakespeare's text, so that I look for all of the things that are in the play that seem like red herrings or don't make sense, and try and figure out the backstory that will make them true. And I do try and stay as true to the play as I can without being limited by it. To me, that's the fun of writing Juliet's Nurse, is writing around the Shakespeare, respecting the Shakespeare, but filling in what isn't there, or imagining, I think that he makes the nurse a more interesting character than a lot of his women characters, but he is never really writing solidly from a woman's point of view. And so taking that take against his characters was fun. Speaking about that, um, you've written two female characters now. Might you write? A male character, you're going to stick with a female for your next uh, adventure. I can say that the next book is about a woman, also a historical figure about whom just a smidgen is known, so she's more representing an era, but it's third person. And so in some ways, there are moments from the point of view looking at her, we're seeing how we're in more in the head of a male character, though it's third person. So a little bit of a tease. And who knows what the next one will An be. era? Can you give us a... No, I'm going to be a tease. <laughs> I'll come back and talk to you in a, in a year when I'm ready. Um, it is neither in the 14th century nor in the 19th century and not in Italy nor in the United <laughs> States. I like to make my work really hard, so I sort of start having to relearn the history from scratch. But it's another one that's basically a footnote in history that yeah. you're going you're gonna, to uh, embellish yes. or yes. blow out a little yes. bit. So that, well, I'll look forward to that. Thanks so much for taking the time to talk about sure. your two novels so far. You've been listening to historical novelist Lois Levine, the author of The Secrets of Mary Bowser and Juliet's Nurse. For more information or to watch this program again, check out the Dialogue website. Just go to IdahoPTV.org and click on Dialogue. For Dialogue, I'm Marcia Franklin. Thanks for tuning in. Presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family's legacy of building the great state of Idaho. Check out our website, become a friend on Facebook, or follow us on Twitter.